Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you happen to be. I'm Sarah Cook, Senior Marketing Communications Manager for Coringo. Thank you for joining us today. Before we begin, let's review a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the question field. We'll try to answer all of your questions. If we don't get to your questions, we're happy to chat with you after the webinar. You can reach us by emailing info at coringo.com. We also have a few polling questions during the webcast that we will be asking, and we've added links to several items that you may want to check out for more information. So I'm excited about today's webcast because we have not one, but two of our Coringo product managers, Ryan Meek and Eric Day. Ryan has worked as a developer, tester, trainer, sales engineer, and now product manager in the object storage industry. Eric brings just as prolific of a background with extensive experience in cloud services, object storage, Linux open systems and applications. Eric oversees Coringo's ongoing development of cloud storage solutions and web-based UI storage management applications. So welcome, Ryan and Eric. And I know I shouldn't say this because I shouldn't play favorites, but I'm going to tell the audience you are two of my favorite people to work with. So I'm so excited about our webinar today. Thanks very much, Sarah. And uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we're really excited to be here with you today and tell you about the evolution of object storage. Uh, we've been really privileged at Coringo because uh, we have been around since the beginning. And when I say we, I include uh, a few people at Coringo that actually started at the very beginning uh, at a company called Filepool, uh, which was founded in Belgium uh, by our uh, CTO, one-time CTO, and current board member Paul Carpentier. Uh, that engineering work at Filepool really informed the entire object space. Um, the entire, all the spaces in in IT and scale-out storage that you know as CAS or object storage, uh, really originated um, from that Filepool um, inception. Um, that product was eventually, and that company was eventually sold to EMC, and they released it and built it out as the Centera. So that's really in the beginning, and that is one of the reasons why, even with the first generation of Coringo products, uh, we refer to that as second or third generation CAS, and then object storage. So, so what was the Centera actually, and how did that relate to object storage in general. Um, it was what was then called CAS uh, that stood for Content Addressable Storage. And the basic idea behind it was you could arrive at a place in a storage cluster or a place on disk uh, by hashing the content. Uh, now this is, this actually, this strategy had legs uh, and we still see it in some forms today. Uh, in the scale-out object spaces, um, but it had a few problems that it introduced, and and one was, you know, how to expand a cluster and how to expand a cluster really in any increments. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, the entire sort of product was also characterized by proprietary protocols. So, you know, what do I mean by that? I generally mean there that in order to write content to uh, the CAS or to the Centera, uh, you needed to tie an application to it with a proprietary um, API uh, that wrote a uh, more or less undocumented uh, protocol. So this wasn't a protocol that was open, uh, that was well understood that anyone could write to, and it required essentially bundling someone else's proprietary code into applications, which ended up being really kind of less than ideal. Um, now, Coringo, actually, after Filepool was sold off to EMC and became Centera, the Centera product did, did very well uh, in the market, but it fell short a little bit with customers um, and actually uh, our former CTO, Paul Carpentier, was uh, using a Centera at, a, at an effort 
or a business that he had afterwards, and he noticed a lot of the usability problems. And he had uh, not only some intellectual property from the file pool days, but he had some uh, ideas about what the next generation of storage would be at that point. So that was really the inception of Coringo, and that bridged the CAS world to the object world. Uh, one way was by uh, sort of not being limited by the content addressable nature of object placement, but in a big way it was by adding HTTP um, as a front end. And this really opened up these architectures to really all the computer languages, all the applications, and it made access to the data open. Um, this is a really major leap forward. And then this, this strategy was uh, really validated in the market. Um, Amazon came along and used HTTP as a storage API uh, in their S3. And then there were also you know, a series of companies that, that used HTTP as a storage API. This, is a, this was a pretty big leap, actually. Um, you know, hypertext transfer protocol really was thought of uh, in the beginning as something for web pages and then something for more static content. And using it as a storage API was a big, uh, really a big step forward. So, you know, as soon as you start using APIs for new purposes and a set of companies and a set of products get together uh, using APIs that way, uh, there is inevitably a movement towards standardization. Um, and so in, in our case, we watched storage APIs and, and HTTP in particular um, evolve towards uh, standards. And um, so I wanted to actually call out to uh, Eric Day here. He, he uh, in addition to being a former technical account manager and systems engineer, application developer, uh, many other hats, um, he is a product manager overseeing the entire Swarm 9 suite of products uh, at Coringo. And he watched um, the standards development very closely. Uh, we've both been around, uh, you know, this isn't our first time around the block. Uh, we've both been around and watched these transitions. So, Eric, uh, I wanted to call out to you explicitly here, um, and I was hoping you could just chime in with a few words about standards bodies and, and how these standards sort of developed over the years. Sure. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so, one of the favorite sayings that continues to hold true is that the, the great thing about standards is that there's so many of them. Uh, so you could pick and you could pick and choose, and that's actually the definition <laughs> of them too. Um, so as Ryan was mentioning the the history in in the previous slide of what you know we we came from file pool and then Centera, and uh, the Centera had a um, the Centera had a proprietary binary protocol for talking with, uh, with for client applications to talk with the storage system, and that that worked well for some applications, but there was there was a hesitancy in the market um, to uh, adopt that because there was only one storage product that was supporting that, which was the Centera. You couldn't, if you wrote an application to talk to that, you were you were locked into the Centera and its its direction. And so what you started to see is as the as that market started to slow down, the um, SNEA, which EMC is a, a member of, um, they the proposal was for a protocol which is ZAM, and and ZAM really took the um, really took the, the the API for the Centera and translated it in, into ZAM. There 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 were some there were some changes, but it was a pretty pretty close. You would certainly recognize the family lineage um, of the translation into ZAM, um, and that was happening as you know, it was the Centera was was slowing down, um, and these other these other object storage things were taking off in cloud storage, Amazon S3, and what you saw in the market then was as those as those HTTP oriented um, storage protocols um, 
were clearly gaining traction and um, press and that uh, customers were interested in using them and applications were being developed there. Um, what you then saw from STIA was the um, was CDMI come out. And, and CDMI really is just a translation of XAM into uh, an HTTP transport. Now, I, of course, oversimplified it in that explanation, but um, again, it's kind of tra trying to translate the old thing into the new, uh, the, the new, the new language. But um, that's that's kind of what CDMI is and was. Um, is it's uh, you know, HTTP transport for XAM? XAM was the um, translation of a proprietary protocol into a proposed standard. And so we're sort of left with these with these protocols here that are that are out there. There was some, a lot of marketing around CDMI. Um, uh, several years ago, um, but it's kind of it's kind of tailed off at this point. And so that's uh, that's kind of the history of the, those 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 standards. So, Eric, we've so got our first audience Go question. Um, do you see an opportunity for ZAM and CDMI protocols to still be relevant in the marketplace? Um, thanks for asking that question. The um, it's it's actually kind of interesting that EMC has recently released a new um, a new product um, ECS that is um, object storage cloud storage um, based and what was extremely interesting is if you if you look at that they don't support the um, XAM or CDMI protocol in ECS and that that's actually very telling because they were the architects of those two protocols. And so I think the tea leaves is, if you're going to read the tea leaves there, it's that, no, I don't think that those protocols have, have future traction. Um, what, what we've, we've observed, you know, Ryan and I and the rest of the company is that um, there was a lot of interest in CDMI several years ago when it was first, um, first introduced. Um, but we just have not seen the applications um, fall in behind it. We had customers ask about it, and that's really kind of a result of the marketing efforts to educate customers and tell them that they needed CDMI. But the application developers never, um, you know, the, the major vendors never, never produced um, relevant applications that used it. So it looks like you know binary uh, protocols are also moving towards HTTP protocols, probably influenced by SOAP. Um, but uh, we, I mean, just to confirm here, we just haven't seen much adoption of these in the application and user landscape, right? I mean, th this really looks like standards bodies catching up instead of leading. Is that is that right? Yeah, that's that's that, that's essentially right. It's reactionary. And um, I'll, I'll just uh, call out to my bullet here. I threw that question in. It, <laughs> do we actually need more standards? Uh, in this space, or do you feel like the space is limited in any way by, uh, you know, these not being well defined, or do you feel like, you know, we're just we're beyond it and we're we're all moving forward? Um, standards would certainly be nice, but what we what we continue to see in open systems time and time again is that the standards normally work this way, and that uh, you have a whole pool of things people are doing, and an ad hoc standard or ad hoc leader develops. And it's later than that, um, it's later than the, the real benefit is when the community comes together and, and hones in and defines something as a standard. You know, it takes something that has already been an ad hoc mm -hmm. adoption by everybody and then makes that a standard. I mean, JavaScript would be an example of that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, so is S3, S3 is certainly a very powerful um, object um, storage protocol out there. You know, is Okay, not that's a great. So I'm glad <laughs> you brought up S3 because we're going to be getting to that uh, later in the chat. Um, I want to just move forward a little bit. Um, I usually do, or I've done in the past, uh, an object storage basics uh, primer. Uh, for anyone that might be joining that's new to it, just so we have sort of a definition of terms, we tend to speak about object storage uh, like people that have had their heads down in it for years, um, but we know a lot of people are coming to it for the first time. So I just want to go through a real basic uh, run through here. 
Um, objects are a way of storing data that's really sort of as opposed to a file. And objects, the, the key object idea behind objects is that they're metadata and data. Uh, in many cases, object storage systems, uh, they provide a, a platform for these objects and built in are ideas of data protection, high availability, um, all at high performance. Um, we've said HTTP is a very common front end protocol and it becomes an ideal system for cloud storage, particularly because that idea of scale is built in, and particularly because uh, it's been a way that people have gone from, you know, older ideas of strongly consistent databases and, and somewhat limited hierarchical file systems to, you know, eventually consistent systems with nearly unlimited flat address spaces. So it's a, it's a major step forward in data protection and high availability and access um, in the world. Uh, and so this is, this is the whole system behind it. And I'd just like to introduce that. Um, I also wanted to make a couple of housekeeping notes here. Um, please, if you do have questions as we go along, you have a place to enter those. We'll do our very best to get to them. Um, we have more or less, you know, 45 minutes that we expect uh, in the presentation, uh, but we would be happy to run a little bit later um, if we get quite a few questions. So with that, I will move forward. So here we are in the market. Um, scalable object messaging is widely adopted. Uh, we see products, and there's quite a few of them that have the, the scale out messaging to them. Um, but I would, I would just like to plant a flag here that many of them use, uh, you know, very older generation or traditional systems like relational databases and hierarchical traditional file systems. And the, the object messaging and indeed the object sort of front end is, is just a layer on top of that. Um, we've seen that happen pretty steadily since the beginning. Um, so Eric, I wanted to call out to you specifically here. Um, if you have, you know, notes on how to tell the difference between some of these um, sort of products that are um, object all the way down or, you know, products that are more object um, as, as an assembly of other components. Yeah, sure. So the, um, one of the first key things to look for is how does stuff get stored on disk? And what you will see in many architectures is you'll see an underlying Linux file system where it starts out of go, go install a server, uh, format a Linux file system, and then let the layer on top store its stuff, provide an abstraction to the files underneath. And the challenge with that is that the, a block-based file system was designed for some very specific purposes, but they were designed long before the idea of object storage. And they, they have some real drawbacks with object storage, that they do things that object storage doesn't need, adding unnecessary overhead to it. Some other so you, things to so, you would, for, so you would say a real quick thing to look for would be, you know, do they do they right out out of the gate do they ask you to go install an operating system and then install a legacy traditional file system at, at the base yeah. of the whole thing? Right. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great way to look for it. Um, and then and this and ties then in really nicely with the files. the audience go question ahead. that just popped up. This ties in really nicely. Um, and ask, you know, what is the state of the art in object storage? Well, state of the art, that's a great question. And, and actually, we are going to segue into speaking about our upcoming Swarm 9 release. Uh, and I think we're, we're about to get there. So I would like to uh, address that as part of Swarm 9. We, um, 
at Coringa, we have a few thoughts on the next generation of object storage for sure. And so, uh, and it was really developed um, for customer requirements and to manage petabytes of data and billions of objects. You know, just like we were saying, that's actually a, that's a tough proposition if you lay down traditional file systems. It really needs a purpose-built architecture. And so we saw these new requirements for data, um, you know, through the last years working with data at the petabyte scale. Hey, Ryan, I had one more thing I wanted to add about the, um, uh, about what to look for. And, and it's really just, Please. look at the architect, yeah, look at the architecture of the object storage system that you're that, that you're considering because what you will find in some architectures is that they are a collection of all the latest and buzziest uh, technologies out there and while we we absolutely love using you know open source stuff within our within our system or popular projects the the problem is that when you pull together you know half a dozen or more of them uh, in order to make your scale out stable, highly available storage, you know it's very questionable about whether or not you know d that's really designed as highly available and in, in, in scale out uh, because the architecture is based upon so many components that you have a lot of places for failure and you have a lot of places yeah. where things can get out of sync and, yeah. and out of sync is is just as much of a failure as you know as a disk drive going bad. Yeah, and many times those haven't been qualified with a complete stack, right? I mean, it's it's putting together uh, different APIs from different teams that might not have ever met each other. <laughs> right, right. Or you might have critical components of your system that are that's really a it, that's really a an open source project that you don't have any control over. So an introduction of a bug there could have very devastating effects over the right. uh, operation of the system. So I think so. I think getting back to the object storage evolution and and the really continuation of features, I think I would say that the basis that's been there even since, say, version one of uh, what was Swarm and uh, would be high availability and data protection. So I would say that would be you know the the real foundation. Um, but what we've seen and what we are moving towards um, is fully functional search and analytics and multi-protocol access at scale. And so I again wanted to call out to uh, Eric Day, um, who is not only a product manager, but also does quite a bit of work with the engineering teams on Swarm 9, um, just to tell us a little bit more about what that evolution means to us uh, right now. Yeah, thanks. So the the as as Ryan pointed out, that is correct. That you know the, the really the foundation of this is high availability and data protection, and that's what you want from your storage. But where the where this is going is that that's that's no longer enough any longer. You you want your you want your disk drives now to be smarter than that. You want your storage system to be smarter than that, and you're looking for your storage system to really move up the stack and to provide um, higher level capabilities than just um, a place to put your data and a promise that it will be, be there when you want it. You want to introduce features such as the ability to search on, um, search on your data. This is, the searching is, is crucial when you're talking about billions. Uh, when you're, we're in the scale, it's no longer um, it's no longer feasible for a human to figure out the, um, a single hierarchical organization um, for data, or it's not feasible to say that you know, data that I put in through one application in one in, in one place um, is only going to ever be used by that one application. What you want to do is reuse your data among other applications, and that's where search becomes very important because now you have the ability to unlock that data from the original application that, that saved it. And multi-protocol access is also a crucial requirement. And by multi-protocol access, I'm going to say this about it, that you need multiple protocols to be able to access the same data, not just a storage system that has these multiple interfaces and it stores the data internally as silos, but a, a true namespace where you know, an object put in through one protocol can be 
can be used and, and uh, used and updated through another through another protocol. So, so I'll go ahead and advance here yeah. because we have we have uh, plenty to show you on this track. So uh, I think I think your point, Eric, about uh, managing content at, at billions of files is a perfect segue into uh, these points. Why don't you go ahead and, and run with it? Sure. So what you see is a the the, the poor storage administrators. Um, the teams are getting smaller, and there's more work that they have to do. And just this is in general a trend in in in, in IT is that people are looking for the ability to do um, self service, um, and for IT administrators to be able to delegate um, that self service capability to their um, to their users and, and customers. And so the, the thing to look at here is from your storage system, your storage systems you know, traditionally have been very focused for the storage administrator around giving them details about the, the nuts and bolts. You know, how is the connectivity in the system? How are the disk drives doing? You know, how many IOPS is a drive taking? Or how are your different controller channels doing in the system? But a storage administrator spends most of their day managing data. They don't spend a lot of their day replacing disk drives um, and, and, and replacing bad controllers. The, the, the real thing is about they're servicing user requests. So I need another LUN set up. I need data. I've overrun this. Um, you know, I, I need more storage because I, I filled something up. Um, that, so they spend a lot of their time managing the data. So what is your storage system doing for you to help you manage data? And really with a Asking more from your storage administrators from a smaller teams, they really need to be able to delegate out capabilities with roles-based um, access control, so that they can allow their users to do some of their own um, do some of their own management of, of data and, and storage. And this and really, so, this really, you're, you're really bringing up here whether you provide it in a multi sort of a multi-user, multi-tenant, multi-admin kind of way, right? Yeah, we used to talk about this as there was the enterprise where you had the IT organization and they did everything for their users, and you had um, MSPs who were considered the multi-tenant, um, the, the people who needed multi-tenancy. But what you've really seen is that multi-tenancy really is, is a concept that enterprises are rolling, uh, really want and need because they're internally starting to act like MSPs to their own to their own users, and that I need to set I need to set quotas, or at least understand how much storage you're using. I need to be able to delegate responsibilities to you within a certain realm of the system, and that's that's kind of where the multi-tenancy doesn't just mean um, MSPs any longer. It really is about um, all all deployments of systems. So that's really public almost public cloud levels of functionality and service in a in a private cloud infrastructure. That's right, yes. So I will move forward here too. You mentioned uh, collections and you mentioned being able to operate on content through different protocols. So maybe you could take us through uh, a little bit of the Swarm 9 plumbing that also kind of enables those scenarios. Sure. So I, I didn't uh, – let me let me circle back and, and actually define what collections are in our system. We uh, Brian mentioned on a couple slides back how search um, is part of the expectation for, um, for systems. But we have that in our, our Swarm system, and that is the, – the notion for that is uh, collections. And collections are a – defined search based upon the metadata of the objects. And that becomes an organizing principle and a, a very powerful tool within our, within our system. Um, take, for example, a – I'm going to use kind of a pedestrian one of you know, image files, so JPEG images. You can define a collection based upon content type. So you could say, I want to look at all images in the system because I have some photo analytics. Um, application. And 
with Swarm 9, one of, the, one of the features that we have is that with the multi-protocol access, you can define a collection and then export that as an NFS, as an NFS share. And so you can have an application that knows how to read from NFS. Now, look at this dynamic, what, what is a dynamic network file system um, that shows the results of the saved search or this collection within the, within the system. So, um, so many systems out there that are smart about metadata or that can, that can provide some, some of these kinds of features, you actually need to pre-configure a schema for what you're looking for here. And so um, I wanted you to, if you would, just say a little bit more about whether you can do this at runtime or you know, what you need to have figured out ahead of time. Yeah, actually, that's a that's a good point because we've had content management systems or CMSs out there for a while, um, and those those really kind of suffer under that um, that idea that you have a database schema, and when you add a file into that system, it's got this schema and it's got this set of attributes it asks you for um, for an object that that doesn't work very well when you're thinking about it at scale. There's no way that you could take a storage system that um, is going to service, say, a dozen different departments within a multinational company or, or more than that, you know, business units, and agree upon what your schema is going to be. In fact, a single team probably can't agree upon what a schema should be for two different <laughs> applications. That's true for a lot of teams I've worked on. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason is because it's kind of a fool's errand in, in a way that trying to figure out what your schema is going to need to be in a year or two years, um, it just really can't be done. And so what you, what you need is you need a search, um, a search foundation that understands that I'm going to have imprecise definitions of, my, of what attributes um, I describe things by. And, and some of them are going to be described in different ways. And so you need a you need a, a real search engine capability, not not a database, but you need a search engine capability that can take some of those ambiguities um, and stitch them together. So maybe you can say a few more things too about um, how we integrate search engine technology and what kinds of things we index and pre-index, um, both by default and uh, by you know, optional configuration. Sure. So the the um, I, I brought up a point um, a few minutes ago about looking at the architecture and looking for where it can break in a system. And so what we see in other um, other storage systems is that they that they will separate the metadata into a database and they'll have the object body stored someplace else. And so there becomes a synchronization issue there. There also becomes a potential scaling bottleneck there. We took a different approach. What we do is we have the metadata and the data saved together for an object on storage. And then our searching is an augmentation upon that. Um, the searching is actually a non-critical component of the system and that the search database can always be rebuilt from the data that is on an object. And it also presumes nothing about the object. So um, when an object is put into the system, whatever metadata happens to be on that object is what is um, indexed into the, the, the database. And so we make use of a system that um, is, it scans through the, the information as it comes in, as it's saved into the system, and it, um, it's, it writes this search engine, the, the search engine representation of it in a way that is, um, that is not it doesn't become a single point of failure or a crucial, a critical point in the in the system, Ryan. I think you and had I a think of, and I think uh, yeah, there was, yeah, there was a specific question that came in, and um, it said since the metadata is part of the object, how does searching and collections oper operate across large numbers of objects? And I think you were you were speaking to that pretty directly. Um, and I would just I would just add specifically that you know the way that we talked about objects as metadata and data well the metadata are on the protocol they're http headers right and yeah. in 
in the, in the representation of the object on disk, those headers are kept with the data, as we pointed out. But those headers are also sent to uh, indexing um, as they arrive. So they're pre-indexed so that you can get millisecond response time for queries, even if you have hundreds of millions or billions of objects. So thanks a lot for that question. I think that's a, it's a great point when you're trying to picture, um, you know, trying to visualize the call path of searching through metadata that's uh, fanning out across server farms and, and how that could possibly come back in milliseconds. So um, I also uh, have a question here, or it was really more of a comment um, about a little bit of difficulty making out some of the text on the screenshots. I think the main takeaway there to, to see is that that is, is metadata for data that is uh, the picture, and the metadata are actually um, HTTP header information. So, you know, the particular aspects of that are going to be um, some some combination of standard HTTP kind of metadata, like content length, which would describe the amount of data, uh, but also uh, custom metadata. And so maybe, Eric, you could say a little bit more about um, custom metadata and, and objects. Um, that, that might also inform what we speak of with the next slide, which is uh, metadata annotations, which is sort of downstream metadata. Yeah, so the the idea on this slide is that um, objects objects will have, you know, some metadata up to a lot of metadata with them. And so collections are really a way for users to, to organize and search and um, reuse that data. The, the screenshots here are kind of an example of how you would go through and um, we give users a a, a way to go through and just with a pick list, you know, just select which fields they wish to start a new collection from. So they could take a representative um, piece of content and choose which fields were important um, to put into this this collection or this, this saved search. Um, metadata is, so you ask about custom metadata. That's, that's actually a very, that's a very powerful feature that an object can be self-describing in that it's not just about what, you, you know, the, the real basic stuff you know about an object where, you know, it's, it's a JPEG or it's a PDF and what time it was stored, what, you know, that, that kind of stuff. But an application can put a lot of additional information and knowledge into an object, <clears throat> um, such as, you know, what, what kind of, what project was this for or what is the general area of study? that something is, is concerning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's useful for things like, um, let's take some things like, uh, like medical imaging that would be associated with um, uh, patient records. You know, you're gonna have stuff about the patient, you're gonna have stuff about what the condition was that you were looking at, um, who, the, who the doctor or technician was there. Mm -hmm. You've also got other data like video, video streams some video streams are, you know, entertainment oriented stuff, but other video streams are, are streams or things like uh, security cameras that may become evidence in the future. I'm glad you uh, I'm glad you brought up video. I think that's a really nice segue to into um, metadata annotations and, and the kinds of metadata that you might discover downstream after you have the initial file. Yeah. So in the case of um, in the case of things that are evidentiary, <clears throat> um, there's we have a lot of customers that they make use of metadata, and they also have a need though they they have some very strict provenance rules when it comes to the original data that goes into the system. So data from a video camera or um, image captures or maybe even files that are captured um, as part of some discovery, um, they they likely have some metadata on them um, at the time that they're stored in order to help um, help with the organization of them. But then later, you find that, you find that people need to um, describe them in more detail. They, they, they maybe, you've got a video stream that you don't know if there's something mm -hmm. there or not. And so you mm -hmm. have somebody actually analyze and watch it and then make additional notes or annotations about that. But due to the providence rules, it's, 
you can't touch the original object. You can't update and modify the original object. You need to leave it pristine and preserved as it was originally written into the system. Um, yeah, and, really that, and that might be automated there. tasks like facial recognition or geographic coordinates or, you know, even even just uh, indexing, you know, speech to text or something like that, right? Right, yeah. So you you have these, you know, uh, human or even um, automated processes that could come along later and analyze data after it's been stored and wish to make additional notes about it. Um, so annotations is a real is a is a is a is a real powerful method in Swarm Nine now to uh, allow you to leave the original object um, untouched and unmodified, and yet add these additional um, either structured or unstructured metadata on the object. And I think that's really important to I think it's really important to emphasize and call that out. So, you know, with Swarm Nine, this is a perfect platform for scale out. Uh, digital evidence lockers uh, for scale out compliance environments uh, because it actually has a metadata uh, platform, a metadata system, um, and and it does not require actually opening up and changing the original objects. And that is super important for uh, use cases where, like you said, provenance is important. Yeah, and and we build this, we build all the searching and metadata features and the annotation features. We build those into our storage system as part of our um, as as part of our HTTP protocol. And that's that's actually another important thing to look for with um, with an object storage system is, do they actually have a message around how do I use that metadata after I have put it on an object? So we, we see some systems where they say, yeah, if you put metadata on the object, we'll stuff it in the database and you get to figure out how to make sense of that and how to use it. Yeah. Um, what we're doing is we're giving you a way that we're saying that we need to provide you just as equal access, you know, full security, full lifecycle management, full protection. We need to make metadata part of the overall, um, part of the overall storage story, not just an afterthought where it's like, well, we'll put it over there and, and you figure out how to, how to break into that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, um, that's a really key feature. Uh, anything else that you want to bring out or emphasize on Swarm9? I know it's been a ton of work for you and the team, and uh, you know, we're super excited to have it coming out. Uh, the real, the, you'll see a lot of the, um, the, the, the real noticeable parts of it will be around the, um, around the user interface. Um, the user interface, I will point out, as I was saying in the, a couple slides ago, it's, it's not just about the, it's not just about the, uh, the, the nuts and bolts of the storage hardware underneath. The real thing that it needs to provide for users is a way to manage your data and, um, you know, delegate, use rules-based access control, um, and let end users participate in the system. So what does your storage system do for your end users? And that's where collections mm -hmm. um, yeah. and the multiple protocols come into play. I think that's a great point. Well, um, thanks everybody for being here. We also wanted to um, call out to Sarah to tell us a little bit about uh, the next webinar in the series. Uh, we're really happy to be here with you each week now, uh, trying to actually turn it into something very regular. So maybe Sarah, you could say a few things about uh, the fast track to object storage coming up next week. And thanks, Eric. That was a great color on the Swarm 9 release and the evolution of object storage. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Sure, and um, we've we've still got um, a question coming in. So after this, we'll get back to questions. Um, so next week, we have um, a special presentation by our VP of Marketing, Adrian Herrera, my boss, and um, our senior solutions engineer, John Bell, about getting on the fast track to object storage. So this is going to be a really great presentation. Um, we have something exciting happening next week. Um, so we'll, we really hope that you can join us for that um, broadcast on Thursday, October 20th. So feel free to go ahead and register. 
and hopefully we will see you there. Also, uh, somehow my polling questions did not take, um, but one of them, um, I wanted to see if anybody needed to speak with um, an object storage engineer. We know it's a pretty um, heavy duty technology, and so if you have uh, questions that are very germane to your own business situation that you don't want to ask publicly, please feel free to in, um, email us at info at .com and we'll have somebody get back with you. We monitor that email box, so feel free. And you can always put it to Ryan or Eric's attention or to mine, and I'm happy to track down the right person to get back um, with you on your answers. So thank you so much for joining us. And we've got a few more questions, so um, if you guys don't mind sticking around for a minute, let's uh, get some answers. Okay, thanks, Sarah. We'll take a couple more. Um, I like this one. It says, it sounds like object storage as you originally defined it has been achieved. What are the problems that still need to be solved? Uh, I think that's a perfect one for Eric, especially with the context of Swarm 9 and what we see coming uh, in the future. Um, in, a, in a way, that, that's, that's true. What we, what, we, what we originally started out with was to provide for highly available scale-out storage. Um, we started with the idea of what if, what if storage were, what, what if disk drives were free? What would you store and what would you do and how would you how would you manage that? And that was where we started from. And where we're so where this is evolving, what problems still exist, is that storage needs to come up the stack. Storage needs to do more to inform, help you manage the data within it to 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 really bring out the value of data, meaning that you can discover data that an app, one application stored and used, you might not be using that application anymore, but that doesn't mean the data um, is is no longer valuable. And so this is where searching capabilities come into play to bring out, you know, reuse data that's already in your system and reuse it in different ways or unlock data from an application that may still be in use. You might have a, um, you know, a simple one might be you've got a, you've got a, uh, something that is just, that's archiving your, um, archiving videos in it. Well, you come up with a way that you can do some video analytics. Um, but that application doesn't know how to do that, but still you're going to use it, the data that it put in the system, you're going to use it in another in another new way that doesn't interfere with the original application. So that's, you know, what's what still what problems still be, need to be solved? Storage needs to get smarter and come up the stack. It needs to help users manage their own data better. It's no longer about managing disk drives. It's now about managing your, your data and your content and, and doing that at scale. Um, there's a real big difference between a thousand and a billion. You know, a, a thousand, a, a human might be <laughs> Absolutely to true. A, a billion, a human cannot. <laughs> a billion of anything is a lot of things, right? That's, that's a lot. That's a lot. That's a large number. <laughs> I think that's a great place to stop here. Sarah, did you want to say any more uh, words before you take us out? Uh, so no, um, I, I did want to make sure that we got some clarification on the encryption and that will be available um, when you update to Swarm 9, correct? Correct. Great. So I appreciate everybody um, for taking their time today to spend with me and Eric and Ryan. And we hope to see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.